The Veritas Forum is an opportunity for the Iowa State University community to come together and explore life's hardest questions. The students and campus ministers who have planned this forum are inspired by the idea that Jesus Christ has something relevant to offer our university in its search for knowledge, truth, and significance. We welcome those who bring other backgrounds, perspectives, and commitments to the table and honor all questions, just as we bring questions of our own. Our hope is that this Veritas Forum will not just be an academic ex exchange of ideas, but rather that it will come out of a real community earnestly exploring questions of real importance. We hope that this afternoon's event will draw all of its participants into real conversations, questions, discussions, stories, and friendships. The Veritas Forum at Iowa State University is co-sponsored with the ISU Committee on Lectures, funded by the Government of the Student Body. It is a partnership of the several campus ministries listed on the next to last page of your program. We wish to thank our sponsors for their financial support. They are listed on the back of your program. We especially want to acknowledge our major sponsors, Great Plains Diesel Technologies, Wilson Toyota Scion, Cornerstone Church, Trinity Christian Reformed Church, ISU Christian Educators Network, InterVarsity Graduate and Faculty Ministries, and the Veritas Forum. We also want to thank the Veritas planning team for their hard work and dedication. The members of the planning team are listed on page five of your program. And now, Ann Smiley Oyen, Associate Professor of Kinesiology, will introduce this afternoon's presenter. We're very pleased to have Dr. Mary Poplin as our Veritas 2011 speaker. Dr. Poplin did her graduate work at the University of Texas and is currently a professor of education at Claremont Graduate University in California. She and her colleagues recently conducted a five-year study in which they examined characteristics of highly effective teachers in low-performing urban schools in Los Angeles. She gave an excellent presentation yesterday on the results, and I don't know if we have any educators out here, but uh, in a nutshell, safe to say, uh, traditional, strict, um, loving, very devoted to the students, but very demanding were the highly effective teachers, and many of them were Christian. Uh, she teaches courses at Claremont in Okay, we're good here. Well, it's on for now. It'll probably run out again. In pedagogy, learning theory, qualitative research, philosophy, and world views. Dr. Poplin held a variety of secular world views prior to becoming a Christian. She was in her Christian walk. Here we go. It's been a challenge this semester for me, trying all kinds of new technology, even the mics. All right, um, so several years into her Christian walk, she spent two months with Mother Teresa and the Sisters of Charity in Calcutta. Uh, this deepened her life as a Christian. It transformed her view of social work and impacted her work as a professor. She relates this journey in her book, Finding Calcutta, and there will be books on sale um, over to the side of the room after the presentation if you are interested in purchasing one. It's a great read, by the way. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Poplin to the podium. I'm so glad that happened to you instead of me. <laughs> Okay, how many of you were there last night? Because I don't want to repeat too much. Okay, all right, great. 
Okay, so, so I mentioned last night that, um, that my uh, experience with Christianity began after a, a pretty important uh, a dream where I remembered every single event, every single feeling, sight, sound, everything. And that that uh, dream revealed the condition of my soul. And I had mentioned last night uh, sort of where I was, had been intellectually and spiritually and personally. And um, I was, um, in a way, a mess. So I had this dream, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share it with you, and then I'll, um, I'm going to go into the worldviews. In this dream, I'm in a long line of people, and we're all dressed in gray robes. And the part of the dream that I'm in is in black and white, dark gray mostly. And it's like we're suspended in a night sky, but um, sort of uh, very dark sky. And um, in this uh, line that I'm in of people in these dark gray robes, um, I, I actually um, don't know where I am in line. But they're not looking at each other. They're not talking to each other. We're not doing anything but marching like one step uh, at a time. And when I get to, um, when I start marching, and uh, I, begin to real, under, I begin to question myself, wh where am I in this line? So I lean out to my left to look at the beginning of the line, and it just snakes around and disappears. It's like we're sort of, we're not on, really on a plane that's obvious, but we're, we're, we are walking on a plane. Then I think, well, I must be at the back, and, um, and I turn around to my right, and I see that the same thing happens. It's just a sort of endless line of people. And um, all of a sudden, I realize that we're going to pass by something on the right because there's a bright yellow light coming out. And this light, um, this is the first time I've had a dream, had a dream that, where there was any color in it. So all my other dreams are black and white, and most of them are like your dreams, just sort of pieces of things. So um, as I get closer, I'm not actually in the part of the dream that's in color. I realize that it's a live version of the Last Supper. So it's the Last Supper's going on. The disciples are sort of moving around, talking. They're in colorful robes, and they're eating. Uh, and then I suddenly I realize that actually Jesus is actually not at the table with them. And I look up ahead, and Jesus is actually standing uh, up ahead, and every single one of us is passing by him. And when I get to Jesus, I have two sensations in the dream. And in the dream, I have, the first sensation I have is I become aware that I'm made of, my body is made of cells, individual cells. Okay, this is just basic science, right? So uh, I know this, this, that my body's made of all these individual cells, and I become aware of all of them, and yet I'm aware that I'm also one person. And then I, um, I look at Jesus, and when I look at him, uh, again, and I see his eyes, I have a second awareness almost immediately following the first one. And the second awareness is that every cell in my body is filled with filth. Right? It's just filthy. And then when I have that awareness, I actually can't look at him anymore in the dream. So I fall down uh, at his feet, and I start to weep in the dream. And in the dream, he leans over and touches my shoulders. And when he touches my shoulders, I had this perfect peace, perfect peace. Okay, well, I mentioned last uh, night that um, I, I called somebody who I thought could interpret dreams. I didn't really know where that was going. I began to explore Christianity. Then, I, um, as Anne told you, I went to Mother Teresa's. I spent two months there to try to understand why she said her work wasn't social work. It was religious work, and I wanted to understand how, if... Mother Teresa could help me understand uh, in education work with the poor through a Christian lens, through a Judeo-Christian lens. So when I came back, I had this um, this intellectual crisis, and I began studying worldviews at that point. So, I because I realized that for me, the worldviews I had ever taught Mother Teresa was not going to be not going to be comprehensible. And so I really began to study the worldviews as sort of uh, large, uh, big worldviews, not, not where you break them down into little pieces. But, uh, and I looked at scientific naturalism, the, the sort of atheist version. Some people call it scientism, uh, secular humanism, and then pantheism, which are three, uh, I think, the three other major worldviews that are uh, in the world, but also... Two of those are very dominant at the university, and that is secular humanism and scientific naturalism. 
At first, I thought I had an inclination to believe that all these worldviews were false, which is, of course, is not true. Um, but uh, and so soon, I learned that there's a significant overlap between all three of those and Christianity. But there also are some differences. First of all, all worldviews, all of them, begin with a faith statement. It doesn't matter which worldview you're talking about; they have a faith statement. And um, secondly, all non-Christian worldviews contain some principles that are not principles of Judeo-Christianity, and some and all non-Christian worldviews leave out some principles of Judeo-Christianity. So I want to look at, um, especially, the, there are two secular worldviews, right? Naturalism and uh, humanism, or secular humanism. And they are the ones that are the most dominant in the media, the government, the university, and so forth. And then one that's increasingly important in the United States would be pantheism. Um, let me just give you, I try to give you a picture first before I go into some of the, the principles of each of these worldviews. And I just want you to picture for naturalism this particular quote from Bertrand Russell. Bertrand Russell says, even more purposeless, and he wrote this in 1918, more void of meaning is the world which science presents for our belief. Amid such a world, if anywhere, our ideals henceforth must find a home. That man is the product of, of causes which had no prevision in the end of the end they were achieving. His origin, his growth, his hopes, his fears, his loves, and his beliefs are but the outcome of accidental collocations of atoms destined to extinct to extinction in the vast death of the solar system, and that the whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins. So there's a picture of, uh, of naturalism from a philosopher's standpoint and philosophic materialism. And, um, and there is also a picture from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which is actually my more, more preferable picture. So Douglas Adams says in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, far out in the uncharted water, backwaters of the unfashionable end of the western arm of the galaxy lies a small unregarded yellow sun. Orbiting this at a distance of roughly 98 million miles is an utterly insignificant little blue-green planet whose ape-descended life forms are so amazingly primitive they still think digital watches are a pretty neat idea. Many were increasingly of the opinion that they had all made a big mistake in coming down out of the trees in the first place, and some said that even the trees had been a bad move and that no one should have ever left the ocean. <laughs> um, so scientific naturalism's faith statement, its beginning faith statement, is that everything that exists can be ultimately reduced to material phenomenon and its processes. So this is the sort of Bertrand Russell piece about atoms all the way down, all the way up. Uh, Judeo-Christianity does not de uh, deny at all that uh, scientists can reduce things to, re uh, study things that can be reduced to material phenomenon. The only contradiction between that particular principle and Judeo-Christianity is they do not believe that is all there is, that everything is ultimately reducible to, materi to material phenomenon. Second in scientific naturalism or scientism, so, and this it would be um, also a, a sort of half contradiction, half not contradiction of Judeo-Christianity, and that is that the scientific method is the only method for determining what's true. There are no methods outside of science to determine what's true, and um, so everything else is more of a philosophic argument. Now, Judeo-Christianity, of course, believes in the scientific method. It grew out of Francis Bacon's work and other people's work, and Francis Bacon believed that the more you knew about the natural world, you, the more you would actually understand the mind of God. So, so you were not just, you didn't just have the Bible to understand God, you actually had the, the natural world around you. And the scientific method has proven very, uh, extremely productive. Third, uh, another uh, principle of scientific naturalism is that li living things all emerge spontaneously from non-living matter without supernatural design or intervention. Of course, Christianity, um, some Christians believe that they do, it, every, all living things do, uh, did emerge from a sort of one source, one, um, one sort of piece of pieces of matter, 
But um, Judeo-Christian thought does not believe it was without design. So there is a supernatural design behind it in Judeo-Christianity. And of course, fourth would be related to that, higher forms of life always emerge from lower forms of life and through unguided natural processes. And so in Judeo-Christianity, here again, a lot of people actually would, a lot of Christian sci Christians who are scientists would believe this, but they do not believe that it was through unguided processes. So naturally, um, all scientists believe in some part of the evolutionary theory. They all believe that evolution happens within a species, that the finches on Galapagos Islands beaks become harder during droughts and things like that to break the seeds. But they, not everyone agrees that a species can actually change to another species. Some Christians do. They're called theistic evolution people. And sort of the dominant, uh, one of the dominant groups in the United States in Christianity is a biologos group led by Francis Collins, who the, was the head of the Genome Project and now head of the National Institute for Health in the United States. Um, but, so, the big linchpin in naturalism, sometimes you wonder why would, uh, why would the issue of evolution be the linchpin here? And I think that the, pro the reason that evolution becomes such an issue is because ev evolution in the sense of some sort of undesigned evolution process is be and something where you're just kind of set on this course that's always improving is because this also, this idea of every day and every way you become better and better, or every age human beings become more able and more capable, that idea actually also undergirds secular humanism. Okay, so that eventually we have come to a point where we, will, that where we are capable of determining everything for ourselves and, uh, and, and there's no God and no reason to actually look for one. So, um, so second, the, the, so there's actually four different versions uh, that fight about evolution. The two, the three ones that are the most seen in the university, although the third one's not seen as much, uh, is atheist evolution, Darwinian atheist evolution, unguided process, theistic evolution. This was this is the right process, but it was guided, and intelligent design, which which questions certain things like the fossil record, the Cambrian explosion and the idea that mutations can actually produce um, uh, gains in an organism rather than losses. So the thing that we hear a lot r uh, lately is, uh, is the idea, and I, I don't have any reason to doubt it, that we are 95 to 98 percent exactly the same DNA as a chimpanzee. Okay, so I don't really know enough to doubt that, um, but I guess what I end up uh, thinking when I hear that is, well, we don't act 98% the same. <laughs> so my question is always then, how much does DNA actually uh, answer for us, if that's the case? How much can it explain? Regarding morality, uh, off, pretty much um, scientific naturalism goes with what can be done and whatever is negotiated among human beings. Most eugenics movements come out of uh, naturalism, the, the um, abortion of Down syndrome children, which are are is now up to like 95%, I think, in the United States. Um, euthanasia, you know, um, uh, now in, uh, people who are ch uh, choosing their gender, they only want one child or two children. Uh, often women are aborted. In China, women have been aborted to the point where 40% um, of the men wouldn't have a mate. That's how, how many women are aborted there. And, um, and another example I read about the other day is that people don't want redheads. So uh, no offense to those of you who are redhead. I don't understand it myself. But um, So what happens in a lot of conversations around uh, that are very naturalistic is you begin to abstract you begin to think through moral principles through abstractions and through things like uh, focusing on uh, the ecological footprints of people. So uh, the ecological footprints actually of a baby are pretty big. The ecological footprints of handicapped people or other, other 
people are very large, and so you need to limit the population in order for the ecological footprints of other people to be larger. Peter Singer is probably one of the most um, well-known ethicists uh, in the country. He's an ethicist at Princeton. He holds a, an endowed chair there. And he believes that parents should have up to 23 days to decide whether or not their child lives or dies. It's just very pragmatic and utilitarian um, and um, a lot of other things. That in Judeo-Christianity, it's not what can be done. It is what, what can we do. Given what we can do, what should we actually do? And, of course, there is a permanent moral, there are permanent moral tethers in Judeo-Christianity like that uh, all life is sacred. That uh, doesn't come into uh, place so much in scientific naturalism. Not that a scientific naturalist couldn't believe that, but uh, it's not really a part of that. So let's, let's look at biochemical neurology. neurology. So if uh, the people, they, if your love or your, all these things are ultimately reducible to biochemistry or, bio, or, or atoms um, at the bottom level, then um, Alvin Plantinga asked the question, if that's true, that this is just a little, these are all little natural processes, what makes us think that those processes would actually be true or something we wanted to live by? Why would you think that psychoneural uh, chemistry would actually be true? Now, I actually don't uh, question whether or not you can understand biochemistry, psychoneural biochemistry. I don't uh, question that at all. And I would absolutely admit that probably after my change in life where I became a Christian, that my psychoneural processes actually changed. My conversion was not caused by the psychoneural processes changing. My psychoneural processing changed after my conversion. Before I, uh, before I came to Christ, I could hardly think myself out of a paper bag. Honestly, when I look back on it, I couldn't even understand really the worldviews I was teaching, not at any sort of depth, not at any sort of level. Um, Naturalism, each one of these particular uh, worldviews actually counters a different person of the, of the uh, Trinity. So naturalism pretty much always comes against God, and you find that even in the writings of the book, of the, even in the books that you read written by naturalists. So God is not great. Well, he's probably a secular humanist, but um, the God delusion, all of these books pretty much come against God as the uh, origin of life, as the creator. Um, secular humanism, if I were going to give you a picture, a single picture for your mind, it would be a picture that was actually in the Los Angeles Times when Jean-Paul Sartre died um, um, quite a number of years ago, actually now. He was the father of existentialism, or is considered one of the main philosophers of existentialism. And he, um, in this picture, okay, they show Sartre as a statue carving himself. So you have this statue, it's carved pretty much of him all the way down to his knees, and he's still chiseling down around his uh, bottom of his legs and his ankles. And underneath the statue, it says, man makes himself. Okay? Man makes himself. That's the best picture. Existentialism is one of many forms of secular humanism, but that's the, the actual uh, picture that you might keep in your mind for this. Um, there's no, in secular humanism, it sort of started it, because humanism comes out of came out of Christianity. Habermas talks about that, who's an atheist or agnostic philosopher. I'm not sure which he is, and uh, just like science, really grew up with Christianity. But uh, so secular humanism starts with the principle that there is no God and that humans are alone in this world, and they must build the world alone uh, using solely human reason human experience, science, and history. And um, they value principles. Um, I mean, there's nothing wrong with humans working in the world but, uh, to Judeo-Christianity, but there is, there is a God. There is a belief that there is a God. Second, and there's a big uh, emphasis in secular humanism, which is also supported in uh, Judeo-Christian thought, not as extremely, but it is supported, and that is that 
uh, the, the principles of individualism, freedom, and democracy. Those are very high on the list of all those groups, but um, as we'll see, this is uh, slightly different in Christianity. Um, so in, also in secular humanism, individuals determine their own personal morality, and lastly, they also use a kind of utilitarian uh, ethics that's actually negotiated through critical dialogue. So you think of Habermas or uh, Rawls or any of these people who have, have these new theories, and the idea is that you, you bring reasoning people together, and that's how you come up with the mor whatever the moral state is for the, uh, at the moment. Secular humanism tends, from a Christian standpoint, to be second, to Christ's second commandment without his first. It's not a group of people who really want uh, to tear down the world. I mean, they really want to help the world. And Christ's second commandment that you um, uh, do unto others as you would want uh, others to, to uh, do unto you. Um, and that you, though, that second commandment uh, is without the first commandment. In Judeo-Christianity, you, you first love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul, and then, secondly, then you love others as you love yourself. Um, secular humanists counter probably, mo their, the principle in Christianity that they counter the most is the, probably the issue of sin. Um, G.K. Chesterton uh, was a great writer um, in the sort of middle part of the 20th century, he said sin is actually the only empirical provable principle of Christianity, <laughs> a fact as practical as potatoes, he calls it. So um, David Hart, who's an orthodox, um, um, I think, public policy person and, religion per and religious scholar, describes what happened when secularism began to, to take over the world, and he, and he says in the West, David, he, he says, part of the enthralling promise of the age of reason was at, fir at least at first the prospect of genuinely rational ethics, not limited to the moral precepts of any particular creed, but available to all reasoning minds regardless of culture when recognized immediately compelling to the rational will. He says, was there ever a more desperate fantasy than this? We live now in the wake of the most monstrously violent century in human history, during which the secular order on both the political right and the political left, freed from the authority of religion, showed itself willing to kill on an unprecedented scale with an ease of conscience worse than merely depraved. If ever an age deserved to be thought of as an age of darkness, it is surely ours. So the idea that um, you can sort of just negotiate these things with, that, with people, what you, have, you end up having uh, two choices about the ethics of, of whatever, whether it's a country or the global world or whatever. One is you're, you're, you can solve this problem with uh, bell, the bell curve. So here you have the sort of democratic solution to it. Everybody votes, we decide what it's going to be. Or you can, uh, the, in the more totalitarian version of this, it becomes the whims of the elite who are in power. So whatever they negotiate at this critical dialogue, communicative rationality table uh, becomes uh, the ultimate truth. Now, Habermas, who talks a lot about this table that we're going to have, does say that religious people, people with religious beliefs, should be at the table, but they must speak secularly. And that's pretty much what's been uh, going on ever since the university uh, uh, pretty much transitioned to a secular university. So without God, un you're, un the, you're untethered to a moral framework, and so you're constantly either rebuilding it, kind of always renegotiating it. And human beings can do this because there's a belief that human beings have evolved so far that they have the kind of human rationality and reason that will allow them to do that. Um, Stephen Smith, who's a law professor, gives us a couple of um, comments on this. One is, he says that the existence or non-existence of consensus, which would be sort of the bell curve uh, example, um, has no obvious relevance to the question of justification. The standard example is pertinent here. If a, the global consensus through much of world's hist the world's history regarded slavery as acceptable, 
was the consensus actually correct? He gives us another example in freedom. He says, freedom is a term that inspires respect, even reverence. In the abstract, everyone admires it. However, an expansion of one person's freedoms often means a contradiction of another person's freedom. If we recognize and protect the freedom of the pornographer to market, to market pornographic materials, we simultaneously reduce the freedom of people to live and raise their children in a pornographic free community. Now, Anne Hendershot and other people have talked about, and secular humanists, especially secular humanist philosophers over the last, um, I'd say, 50 years, even more than that, but the last 50 years pretty dominantly, talk a lot about language. And there is a kind of assumption, and the more postmodern the secular humanist gets, there's an assumption that this language that we share, inside this language we create our own reality, right? That our reality is embedded in this. So Anne Hendershot is a sociologist, and she tells, talks about major cultural transitions. She says, words often change their meanings as new norms evolve and old cult cultural restraints loosen. Those involved in the politics of deviance, is what she calls it, often foster subtle changes in the language as part of a larger campaign to alter perceptions. An effective media campaign, one for instance that pushes the standards of behavior based on individual desires rather than on moral categories, begins with the redefinition with, re, begins the redefinition with a linguistic assault. The man who preys on boys becomes someone seeking intergenerational intimacy. And the pr promiscuous teenager is simply redefined as a sexually adventurous. From a rights-based pro-choice rhetoric of those promoting assisted suicide to the medical jargon of those promoting the disease model of addiction, advocates for redefinitions of deviance know that the side that wins the linguistic high ground generally wins the debate. Words like crazy and deeply disturbed were once connected to suicide. Today they've been replaced with words like dignity and autonomy, while those who oppose it are stigmatized as zealots. So there are multiple forms of, um, of uh, secular humanism, and these forms include Marxism, existentialism, communitarianism, romanticism, uh, critical theory, and even postmodernism. Secular humanism as a worldview counters Jesus as both divine and man. So that's where the, that's one of the biggest uh, counters, of course, to Christianity. Some secular humanists can accept um, Jesus as a, not just one more good teacher, uh, but not as divine. C.S. Lewis says he did not give us that choice. A man who calls himself the son of God um, was either really the son of God or a lunatic on the same level as the man who thinks of himself as a poached egg. So um, Leslie Newbigin, who um, was tried, I think I mentioned him last night, he was a man who was a missionary to India for a while, and um, he, actually, um, he actually came back to England and then tried to figure out what had happened to England. And I'm going to um, read you his, uh, one of his uh, statements about what really happened uh, with secularism now, and, and Christianity. Where is the kind of linchpin place that we could uh, put our fingers on? Leslie Newbigin talks about the plausibility structure, straight out of Berger, but um, he talks about the plausibility structure of the modern Western mind, which means basically what can the Western mind actually accept as truth? What, what, how does the Western mind work? And so he calls this a plausibility structure, and he's going to compare the plausibility structure of Judeo-Christian thought with the plausibility structure of, uh, of, the, of the modern Western world, which would include secular humanism and naturalism. He says the difference between the two plausibility structures is seen most sharply at the point where we have to come to terms with the Christian tradition about the resurrection of Jesus. The community of faith makes the confession that God raised Jesus from the dead and that the tomb was empty thereafter. Within the plausibility structure of the modern world, this will become something like the following. Okay, so this is the way we can accept it. The disciples had a series of experiences that led them to the belief 
that in some sense Jesus was still alive and therefore to interpret the cross as victory and not defeat. This experience can be accepted as a fact. People do have such psychological experiences. If this is what is meant by the Easter event, it qualifies for admission into the world of fact. The former statement, i.e. that the tomb was empty, can be accepted as a fact only if the entire, pro the whole plausibility structure of contemporary Western thought is called into question. Pretty, pretty powerful statement, I think. Pretty powerful um, idea that uh, that you can only it can only be admitted as this sort of psychological event, and that's the way people present Christianity as a sort of psychological phenomenon, a choice that we make in private. Pantheism is also a spiritual, not a secular um, worldview. Uh, like Christianity, and the picture, you see these pictures all the time of these very serene people in yoga <laughs> positions. <laughs> I guess that would be a good picture for you. Um, or, you know, these films like Harry Potter and all these films where what you're really watching is the manipulation of spiritual power, right? The belief in pantheism, um, which is both New Age, I mean, in the United States, I would say it's more like New Age, Wiccan, neo-pagan kinds of things. Uh, but in the East, it's, there really is there, Hinduism and Buddhism are far more, um, I guess, um, more traditional pictures of actually uh, pantheism. Uh, in pantheism, there is an imminent impersonal life force called spirit that they that's referred to generally as a spirit as spirit or spiritual nature. It is not a personal god, so. There is this sort of just impersonal life force that goes through all of us. I don't really think that Judeo-Christianity completely objects to the spirit being in everything, the Holy Spirit, uh, that's where, where life comes from. Um, but it is not simply an impersonal, uh, imminent sort of spirit that's always inside of us. It, it is a, a personal God who actually hears, knows who you are, who hears what you ask for, who hears your, the cries of your uh, heart. This is, in the United States, largely Oprah Winfrey's religion. She promotes this through the, right, by promoting the books of Eckhart Tolle, Deepak Chopra, uh, Rhonda Burns, and Marilyn Wheatley, and other people. There is a pretty interesting book by Josh McDowell, which is a conversation, I think it's called Oh God, uh, it's a conversation between two women, uh, one of which is pantheist and the other of which is Christian, which kind of helps you see what that would uh, look like. In uh, pantheism, spiritual reality is oneness. I think that what you would say is Judeo-Christianity also believes in oneness um, or unity, um, not in the same way, but certainly there. The process is the, the spiritual actually activities like meditation and other practices lead to individual spiritual enlightenment. Um, now, obviously, Judeo-Christianity has a lot of principles that lead to individual spiritual enlightenment, but it also has a lot of principles that uh, lead to sort larger uh, pictures of things. And it's not as individualistic as, uh, and I, this is kind of interesting because there's a sort of uh, stereotype of Western culture as being very individualistic, and it, and it is right now, but uh, actually, spirit, in spiritual frameworks, um, pantheism is more individualistically oriented than Christianity is. The biggest difference, I, may, I think I mentioned this last night, is the issues of des desire, and, um, the desire and suffering. In Eastern religions, you tend, they tend to try to get rid of suffering by giving of desire. So, the meditation uh, and all of the spiritual practices are to get us to lose our desire so that we can uh, then be, um, be free of suffering. Um, there, there's a lot of, uh, especially in the New Age movement, of things with spiritual, about spiritual power where you try to learn these practices like bending spoons or something and you um, sort of manipulate spirit, so-called spiritual power that way. Um, they don't, most of these frameworks don't deal very uh, strictly with sin. They have, often have ethical guidelines like Confucianism, 
they have ethical guidelines, uh, uh, Buddhism and things, many of which, if not most of which, overlap with Christianity. Um, they believe, some of them, especially Hinduism, believes in reincarnation, uh, so, and, and based on karma, and their ultimate goal is either oneness with spirit for Hinduism or nirvana and no mindness to, for Buddhism. Now, I mentioned last night that I was spiritual and not religious, and what that meant, if I were to sort of translate what I was really saying to you, what were the code words I was using and what did they mean? The code words meant that I was actually better than you because I could be spiritual without a religious framework and I could be spiritual with, and I didn't need a savior, so I didn't need anybody to save me from sin. I could just be, uh, be spiritual. Um, the example in um, a po sort of a popular culture book, this book has been on the bestseller list for years, and that's Rhonda Byrne's Secret. I'm just going to give you a few. Uh, she has, in the back of the book, she has a long summary, just lists of uh, statements that summarize uh, what the secret is, the spiritual secret. And that is that everything is energy. You are a spiritual being. The uni I don't think Christianity would uh, doubt that. The universe emerges from thought. We are creators of our own destiny, and not only of our own destiny, but of the universe. We're all connected and all one. Your power is in your thoughts. She says the only thing you need to do is feel good now. Now is the time to enhance your magnificence. We are in the midst of a glorious era. Let go of limiting thoughts. Experience humanity's true magnificence. What you do with the secret now that you know it is up to you. Well, you can imagine that the, the actual uh, person of the Trinity that pantheism comes against is this idea of a Holy Spirit, that there is a Holy Spirit and that all spirits are not holy. So you see this in the uh, New Testament and the Old Testament. You see the idea that there is spiritual evil, that there, there is demonic activity uh, and so forth. So... Um, I think that this is, this is problematic in Western Christianity because we often don't want to deal with those uh, more spiritual manifestations because we live in the culture with this plausibility structure that Leslie Newbigin has defined for us. Um, so why was it so... Uh, why could I not only didn't want to go toward Christianity, but why could I actually not understand Christianity from the worldviews that I was actually teaching? Um, and really, um, scripturally, it's described in Romans 1 um, because in Romans 1, it talks about people who turn away from God, how, their, how your mind becomes darkened and your heart becomes hardened. And that was definitely me. Um, so, but, but the, again, I'm going to go to Leslie Newbigin, who says that, from, that the Christian worldview can in no way be reached by any logical step from one of these other worldviews that I've been talking about. You can't go logically from secular humanism to Christianity or from, uh, secular, uh, or from naturalism to Christianity. And that was definitely true for me. I really could only understand Christianity as fragments of ideas. I had largely absorbed what the culture says about Christianity, these sort of stereotypic things. And until I had made some kind of spiritual commitment or even just said, you know, okay, I'm open to this, I really had no way of accessing the sort of big picture of Christianity. So Newbigin goes on from that sentence that this Christian worldview can in no way be reached to, from any, by any logical step from these worldviews to say the Christian worldview offers a wider rationality that embraces and does not contradict the rationality of these worldviews. What's rational or true in these worldviews would be seen as rational and true in Christianity. So, uh, but not everything that these worldviews actually offer as truth would be seen as truth or as rational. So, um, so let me go to the sort of original purpose of making the university secular and the culture secular. I said last night that secularism presents itself as more neutral, more objective, more fair, um, more safe, especially nowadays, it presents itself as more safe than any uh, sort of religious uh, worldview. 
The original purpose of secularism was to actually open the university, which was at that time largely Christian, uh, to other worldviews. And so um, the original purpose was just to allow other worldviews, which uh, wasn't particularly terrible, but what in the, ended up doing is actually as those worldviews began to take uh, preeminence, then the worldview of Christianity began to shrink and be then almost uh, uh, thrown out of the university. Dallas Willard, the philosopher from USC who I mentioned last night, says in his book, uh, Knowing Christ, and I think this is the issue. The issue is whether or not Christianity holds any knowledge. Is there knowledge in Christianity that you act in the Judeo-Christian worldview that you actually can't get from other places? And so Dallas Willard puts it this way. Is reality secular? Is adequate knowledge secular? And is that something that's been established as a fact through thorough and unbiased inquiry? Is this something that today's secular universities thoroughly and freely discuss in a disciplined way? Certainly not, he says. Nowhere does that happen. It is now simply assumed that every field of knowledge or practice is perfectly complete without any reference to God. He says this may be logically possible. It may be logically possible that this assumption is true, but is it true? And I think that's the place that we really find ourselves. We, we find ourselves in a position where what we, what we know and the way, the way that we know is actually considered, and this is Dallas Willard again, it's a calamity of displacing the central points of Christian knowledge into the domain of mere faith, sentiment, traditional, tradition, ritual, or power. So that's why he asked the question, is reality secular? And that's the question I'd stop with so, you could, uh, so you, you could, we could open up for questions. And um, yeah. Would you, you want to do that, right? Thank you. Uh, microphone. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm going to stay down here with this mic. Okay. Uh, first of all, in the program you have, you received a response card. So if, if you didn't leave a response card last night, if you attended, or if you didn't attend last night, we'd really like for you to fill that response card out. And there are boxes by each door, if you can just drop those in. Um, the other alternative is to simply, and you can see this in your program, text veritasisu at gmail.com and text us your name and your um, email account. We're going to put everyone's, whether you responded by card or text, into a drawing. And uh, there will be a, a selection of, I think, 20 books, signed books by Mary Poplin. So if you uh, give us the information, you will be entered into that drawing. Uh, we do have some follow-up from this weekend, or these, these two days. Starting next Wednesday, we're going to have panels, either on a Wednesday or a Tuesday, of faculty members, two faculty members or business people uh, in the community who are going to talk about finding their Calcutta. In other words, their calling. Why are they doing what they're doing professionally in terms of their walk with Jesus? And the first one will be next Wednesday at noon in the Gold Room. Um, and I'll be on the panel and Dr. Alex Tuckness, who is a professor in political science, will be on the panel. So please spread the word. And for the next one, we're going to have one every week, always at noon hour, always in the union, and either on Tuesday or Wednesday. But we don't have them all scheduled yet, so you need to go to Facebook to see when the next ones will be, and we'll have those posted. We're also having book clubs, people who discuss Finding Calcutta. And if you're interested in that, you can mark the response card. Um, with that information, and we'll contact you. Uh, let's see. And uh, after the question and answer, I'm sure Dr. Poplin would be willing to sign some books for a while if anybody's interested or if you, if you want to talk with her. Okay, is there anything else I need to announce? I don't think so. So um, we're ready to open up for questions. I will bring this mic over to that place, 
and you can simply come to the mic and ask a question. Yes, I did. <laughs> it was very helpful, I'm sure, in my life. <laughs> There's not a big market for bent spoons, for bent spoons, but it's kind of an example of how pantheism in the United States becomes what it turns out to be. It's kind of a show of personal sort of prowess at some kind of power, I guess. Power is definitely the thing, the, the word of the century the, uh, in the Western world. And um, it didn't, ha it wasn't like, you know, I'd rather know, I'd rather be able to do like Jesus where you just walk around and heal people. <laughs> it would be a lot more useful than bent spoons. <laughs> there were people in the backyards of these houses where we were doing this. They were usually engineers, interestingly, who were uh, uh, walking on coals. Another highly important thing to the culture. <laughs> Mary, I'll ask you this, because I okay. think you painted a really accurate picture of the, the worldviews that dominate at the university. Mm -hmm. Have you seen, when you've been around the country lately, any signs that that's changing at all? Um, there, there, is, there are some signs, and what it, I think actually in some ways the pantheists are bringing it about even more. But there's a new book called Spirituality and in Higher Education, and there are people who are really, con and there are a number of, of Christians, Jews, and other people who are confronting what is often called the secular imperative at the university. So there are there are groups who are who are doing things, and uh, I think people have begun to to uh, to engage. And I think it's probably generationally this generation is really willing to engage spiritual phenomenon. That the idea that there are spiritual transactions in the world, and we need to know them. Chuck Kraft, who's a missiologist, um, who uh, was for a long time a missionary to, um, to Africa, uh, started writing about what the Africans kind of expected when they got there, that they could perform these sort of supernatural acts, like that they would teach them how Jesus healed and things like that. And they didn't know at all. They had just brought Western medicine and sort of Western theology, which is very secular, actually in some cases, and so um, he, he then spent the rest of his life working on this, and he says that um, there are spiritual laws, you know, trans how do spiritual transactions happen, that he believes are pretty much mirror physical laws, and, uh, and you know, they're, they have principles and they, they operate in certain ways. And so, yes, I see, I see a, a good deal. I think the charismatic movement in Christianity and the renewal movements um, have uh, awakened at least Christians to the idea that there's something missing in the theology, in a lot of the Western theology. You would describe yourself as having a, a theistic um, point of view. Right. Would that be correct? Um, unfortunately, it wasn't there yesterday. But um, you briefly touched on uh, the idea of an underlying moral law or mm -hmm. code, mm -hmm. I believe. How would you go about, well, first of all, how did you come to terms with that? And um, how would you go about um, describing that or um, to so like an evolutionist or a um, secular humanist, I guess. Okay, well I didn't describe it uh, from those two standpoints. Um, the moral law part of Judeo-Christianity, and really C.S. Lewis talks a lot about the Tao, uh, which he says if you really study the moral laws of Buddhist, uh, Hindus, Christians, and Jews, and Muslims, you'll find that there are a lot, there's a lot of overlap there. So he talks about this 
sort of moral law. Other people talk about it as the natural law. That is, there are certain things we all know are wrong to do. So, you know, if you start, you know, killing a baby in front of the audience, everybody knows this is wrong. And um, what I, I guess that part of my struggle with Christianity was also sin. I didn't want to admit I was, you know, not living my life really good. You know, I was having relationships with married men and all sorts of things. And, um, and so that, was, that is always a struggle. I think it's probably the largest struggle for most of us coming to any religion, really, but it's certainly to Christianity because it does uh, have that principle. But basically what um, Lewis says and what other people say is that there are, you have this sort of moral law that we all understand, and it doesn't really change. It doesn't actually change. Uh, secular humanism pro posits that it does change. And so um, then you have that's this sort of constant battle with either the bell curve or whoever's in, ch in power. I hope I answered your question. Well, that actually raises another question. Okay. So you're saying that the moral law doesn't change, and yet we find that the moral law prescribed by religion does change significantly over time. Uh, can you give me an example? Um, most of us today would say that slavery is wrong, unquestionably wrong, and yet right. Jesus encouraged slavery almost. Slaves, obey your masters. Yeah, Paul said that, but he also said, and seek a way, and seek a way to be free. Because here's the really hard thing to explain in Christianity. In Christianity, spiritually, there's a belief that until you actually, until you actually come to Christ, you actually are a slave of something. You are a slave of, spirit, of some kind of spiritual reality. So, and so even Paul, who's totally free, right? Paul calls himself a servant, sometimes a bond servant, sometimes a slave of Jesus Christ. So there's a belief that in the spiritual world we are all slaves. And the idea in Christianity is that you become conscious, that you, be, that you um, begin to have the the foresight to actually make conscious moral decisions. So if that's to be interpreted metaphorically, is that what you're saying? Um, no. Okay. Maybe I'm misunderstanding because it certainly seems like that's not the only endorsement of slavery that we have in the Bible. We have the laws about how to treat your slaves, how long you're allowed to beat right, your in slaves. Right, in the Judea, Judea, Judea scriptures, right? The Hebrew scriptures, right? Yeah. Right. But if you really look at the history of the West, which is the area that has most overcome slavery, you will find that it was, it was largely Christians who led those sure. anti-slavery. In fact, it was Christians on each side, both of them using their own scripture, both yeah, quoting from the did. same scripture. Some of them did. Saying that the, their mm -hmm. scripture supports this morality right, right. over another one. So it seems like... But there is, there is ultimately a truth about that. Right. I mean, there what? there is in in Judeo Christianity the the argument that people are not supposed to uh, wield power over other people is the one that wins because of free will, because of uh, God's idea that He's made all these He's made everybody in His image. Right. So, I believe that those arguments for slavery, even if they use scriptures were actually wrong, and you can see that in the scripture, in the New Testament. You make the point that there's some truth. How come it's not patently obvious if this is being handed down by some supreme being that knows everything and created everything? Well, we never know all the truth. That, that's definitely true. <laughs> I mean, that's going to be true. However, you ha we have more access to truth once we give our life to the God of truth, right? And, I mean, then, that just, and it's not patently obvious. It certainly wasn't patently obvious to me before I, before I was willing to open up to Judeo-Christian beliefs. I mean, that just sounds like blame the victim or no true Scotsman there. I mean, you, it, it's your own fault for not seeing it. I mean, it should be more obvious if this was some ultimate knowledge that everyone should know. I mean, this, this creator or, you know, should be able to tell us and show us I mean, he knows what I'd take for me to believe in him. Mm -hmm. and, you know. He does. And do you, I mean, like you don't believe in slavery, right? 
Even though you're not no. a Christian, you probably don't believe in no, slavery. No, right? I don't believe in slavery. Right, right. Okay, so I, I would say that, most, that people in the world do know that. And that anybody who was arguing against it was arguing against it against the truth. And that you actually, any of us, have access to that truth, that slavery is wrong. Yeah, then why is slavery such an accepted part of their reality, I mean, of history's reality for such a long time? And because only in the like, you know, past 200 years has it been outlawed and you know, obvious force has been uh, taken upon against it. Mm -hmm. Because people sin. That's a. Okay. That's a. Okay. Sorry. 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 Well, I think that because the Bible addresses slavery, it doesn't endorse it. There, there are so many. There are so many other things that the Bible addresses, whether it's um, sexual immorality or the way we treat our parents or um, lying or cheating. Like they, it's addressed. Though all those things are addressed, addressed. Sorry, but they're not endorsed. When. And I read it just today, which, if you don't believe, whatever. But I think, I think the Holy Spirit led me to read this just today. But in Colossians, you're right. It says the Bible addresses, um, addresses like that the slaves should respect their masters and that the masters should honor their slaves. And I think that in doing that, they were addressing a very large part of the culture at that time that slavery was something that you can't avoid. You could, it wasn't something that was avoidable. And so by addressing it and applying that just because, and, and applying Christian beliefs to that situation. I mean. I mean, it can be avoided. I mean, we don't have slavery right now, and we have a functioning society. Therefore, back then, they're just as capable of not having slaves. Therefore, if it were an ultimate truth, as it were, as you were saying, it should just say, don't own slaves. Simple as that. Well, in the, the rules about slaves, actually, I mean, she's right, that everybody had slaves, or people who, and in fact, there are still people in the world who have slaves, right? There are still lots of places where people are enslaved. And um, that doesn't mean that people don't actually know it. And so if you were going to have slaves, which I believe you're saying is there were rules that you had to honor them. They obeyed you, but you honored them. But it's still slavery. It is it's still slavery. owning another individual. Yeah, I agree. It's as property, and you are able to do, you know, beat them, you know. Not, not in those rules you were not able to beat them. Yes, yes, yes you were, as long as they weren't Jewish born. No, that's not true. That's not true. In the uh, Hebrew scriptures, you were not able there, to beat them because they weren't Jews. Jeff, do you want to look that up? Because there, there is a specific place where it says how long you are allowed to beat your slave. It's okay if they die after three days, but if it's after only two or however long length like of time, then you are in trouble. Well, but, there are lots of places that are in the Old Testament in particular that... that Address yeah. all kinds of capital sort but of punishment. I, I do actually want to get to uh, the reason I brought this up in the first place. So mm -hmm. what you're saying is that there is an absolute unchanging moral standard, mm -hmm. and it gets filtered through the culture at the time, right? Am I, is that fair? Right. Okay. Well, the, um, that doesn't mean, because there's an unchanging moral standard doesn't mean the culture is going to be living by it. Right. I agree. Um, the strange thing is, so you mentioned this as an argument that, I think that this is something that Judeo-Christianity has that secularism does not. Well, actually in Judeo-Christianity, there is uh, the idea is that God has actually written the, his laws on everybody's heart. That you really know it. You may not do it, sure. but you know it. But, but right. the, the idea that in Judeo-Christianity there mm -hmm. is this concept of an eternal, unchanging moral, moral law. Moral standard. Uh -huh. And that that it does get filtered through the culture at the time. 
Now, I wonder, how is that different than any other objective theory of morality? Well, the part about it gets filtered through the culture is not a Judeo-Christian principle. The no, cul- that's in, in just every a fact. single culture that Christianity touches, let's say, you know, I could be in Indonesia, I could be in South Africa, I could be here, and while those cultures are different, the unchanging moral standard doesn't change because the culture is different. Yes, it does. We have examples of, say, the Spanish Inquisition is something that most Christians today would say is, yes, nobody expects it. Um, right. That most Christians today would say is... Uh, wasn't a good idea. Was not a good idea, was in fact <laughs> immoral and should not have ever been done. And yet at the time, they had access to... they. Uh, was it not written on their hearts also? Yes, it was. So and here's, they, the, here's the thing. I think that... I mean, you're arguing for sin. You're arguing against basic moral principles that don't change on the basis of the fact that human beings don't obey those principles. I'm not arguing against them. I'm just arguing against religion having a a monopoly on them because there are other... Monopoly on it. Okay. Then I think I'm not... If you're saying... Because it seemed to me like you were using this to differentiate between um, religion which has this unchanging moral standard Mm -hmm. and other philosophies which don't. And it seems like other philosophies do have objective theories of morality that posit an eternal, unchanging standard that we may or may not be aware of. Right. It's that just could arrived be true. At, and that is, that's why I said in the very beginning that there is overlap between every one of these worldviews in Christianity. There's no one who assumes that because you're a secular humanist, you can't understand truth or you can't uh, understand goodness or you wouldn't come up with, even on your own, particular um, moral laws. The issue in Christianity is, okay, and this is this was a really a, a sticking point for me for a while until I really read C.S. Lewis's thing. What happens when someone becomes a Christian? Okay? What happens? What happens is that there is a spiritual transaction. I know this is <laughs> not very ex- explicit for those of you who don't believe in spiritual transactions. But there is a spiritual transaction that, pl- that takes place where your sins are actually taken on by Christ and you as a human being are freed to pursue then increasing righteousness, right? Increasing, you, you become a better and better person. So C.S. Lewis says, for example, and I think this is maybe the root of your argument, um, there are lots of secular people who are better people than Christians are. That's However, not what I'm saying at all. Okay. All I'm saying is that if the point is that the Christian worldview is different because it has an absolute standard of morality and that other philosophies do not have an absolute standard of morality, that's incorrect. And it sounds like we agree. So, Are you talking about, okay, let's say you have a philosophic. Let's just take this a little bit further to make sure I understand. So you're saying that a philosophy can come up with a, a, a moral standard, right? I'm saying that a philosophy can contain a moral standard. A moral standard, okay. But that and worldview then, can contain right, the... Right, I would agree with you. What holds that moral standard in place? In that case... What keeps it from, you know, these debates of those philosophers and they say, well, this is a moral standard. They say, no, this is a moral standard. This is a moral standard. It seems to me that that kind of debate takes place in theological morality all the time also. I mean, the only difference is that you have one text to go back to, yet everyone has their own interpretation of it. So you still have this endless debate of, I am right, my interpretation of the absolute moral standard is the absolute moral standard. Mm -hmm. Well, I think as you grow as a Christian, you realize that... I mean, one-third of the world are Christians, so you begin to realize that you all come in to eventually come down on the same place. That you don't actually, um, you don't actually disagree very much. Uh, 
Dr. Poplin, as an education professor, I assume you have some perspective on uh, maybe sort of changes you would like to see implemented at Iowa State uh, in how we teach certain subjects. I'm interested particularly in your perspective on religious studies education, mm -hmm. which would seem to be one of the more applicable areas for your mm -hmm. uh, particular philosophy. And then also, if you feel it's relevant at all, could you discuss how you would change the teaching of biology with respect to uh, Darwinian or neo-Darwinian evolution? Oh. Well, regarding religious studies, I would say that's not a place where you generally find orthodox uh, beliefs in Christianity, let alone orthodox uh, beliefs. And, um, and I, I don't know, I doubt that you would find even little o orthodox beliefs in the other areas of religious studies. In biology, I'm not a biologist, so I'd have to just take a stab at this. And that would be that I would teach the multiple versions of evolution and intelligent design or whatever. I would just say this is what people believe. This, there's this belief, there's this belief, there's this belief. No one was at the beginning of the universe, <laughs> so we don't really know exactly what happened. There are theoretical ideas that are very important, extremely important. And, um, and the people who are doing scientific work on the evolution, for example, of bacteria that become drug resistant and things like that, uh, anybody can do that, no matter which one of those worldviews, which one of those uh, theories they subscribe to, anybody can do that. So a Christian who is even uh, a creationist who you wouldn't find at the campus, I don't think, uh, would be able to do that. A, a scientist uses particular principles and particular methods that really don't depend on the, the theoretical principles behind them, the, theor the theory about it. Okay, origins. thank you. Hi, thank you very much for your presentation. I have a couple questions for you here. Okay. And the first one is, um, as a Christian, why is it important that I should understand these different worldviews, the competing worldviews in academia? Mm -hmm. And then second, what should I do about it? Okay. <laughs> There's a million dollar question. Um, you should understand them because you should be able to understand what Paul calls plausible arguments. <laughs> that there are plausible arguments that may not be true. And uh, I, my personal belief is that, look, I teach PhD students, and what I really want them to have is the biggest view of all that's available to them. I don't want them to be limited. I used to limit people to basically radical feminism and radical Marxism in terms of their interpretation of education. Um, I don't, I, I believe that was limiting their education. So you as a student, uh, if you're a Christian, they, you are being taught things that actually fall outside of Christendom, outside the princ basic principles of Christianity. And I, for one, since you are a Christian, would want you to know when that was happening and be able to then critique what was going on for yourself so that you don't end up um, promoting plausible arguments or what Paul calls uh, human tradition, elemental spirits of the world, philosophy, empty philosophy. And he has a lot of, of terms about that. And Paul was very well educated, of course, so he knew. I think that the most critical um, kind of missing link in, Christi in Christendom that really needs to be in the university is the spirit of discernment, the actual idea that, uh, that, that you could be able to tell the difference. But we've kind of lost those finer distinctions by having all these uh, sort of competing things, but they're all secular. So I would want you to be able to break out of that and critique it so that you could um, understand where it's true and where it's false. Hi. Hi. Um, I don't really have a question, but I wanted to address what we were talking about earlier. Okay, good. Um, with the slavery issue. Mm -hmm. um, I found the verse that I was talking about, the slaves that you're referring, if it's not the verse that you're thinking of, please correct me, but um, Exodus 21, 20 says, when a man strikes his slave, male or female, with a rod, and slave dies under his hand, he shall be avenged. But if the slave survives a day or two, he is not to be avenged, for the slave is his money. And at first glance, that does seem, you know, if the slave Extreme. doesn't die, then beating your slaves are okay. Um, but 
going back just a couple of verses before that, in verse 18, it says, When men quarrel and one strikes the other with a stone or with his fist, and the man does not die but takes to his bed, then if the man rises again and walks outdoors with his staff, he who struck him shall be cleared. Only he shall pay for the loss of his time and shall have him, and shall have him thoroughly healed. And so I just feel that they're taking the issue of slavery here again and they're taking something a free man and then applying it to slavery using the laws of slavery. This whole section in, the, in my Bible is t titled Laws About Slaves, that whole chapter 21. And interestingly enough, comes right after chapter 20, which is the Ten Commandments and God's law that he gave to Moses about how people should act and treat others around them. So, okay, Thank you. Um, I have two questions. Um, one, you, you talked about your dream and how that was kind of your starting point of, the, of your conversion. Um, I'm interested in any anecdotes or any other stories that you have that um, really confirmed your belief that God exists and um, what really fueled more your conversion. Was it just that dream or was it other like, oh, this happened and this really fueled my um, belief in God? And the second question is, I don't know if you have any experience with the Baha'i faith and their beliefs and your reaction to them. Um, I don't have any experience with the right. Baha'i beliefs, but um, I will tell you of the first one. No, my dream did not turn me into a Christian. Um, ex didn't sort of immediately do it. it. What happened is that I began to pursue it uh, with the help of other people. Um, my belief that God exists and that the Bible is true is founded on now 18 years of experience, right? And uh, I began to just have particular scriptures that I would um, was drawn to, and I would test them, just like anybody tests anything, right? So I tested scriptures like, uh, one of my favorites is uh, one of the ones I really depended on early on was for, uh, in 1 John 1, 9. It says, if you're faithful to confess your sins, he's faithful and just not only to forgive you, but to cleanse you from your unrighteousness. And um, since you wanted an anecdote, I'll give you an anecdote. Um, I told you that I had um, uh, had a lot of different relationships. And during some of those relationships, uh, we watched a lot of pornography. So when I became a Christian, it wasn't like rocket science to know this wasn't right. <laughs> so... Um, so I confessed it, and, uh, and I used to that scripture, um, you know, okay, Lord, um, you know, I want to confess this and get free of this. But even just, and I was free. I was free. I didn't go back to pornography ever again. But for about three years, I would be driving down, you know, the highway, not thinking about anything sexual, and those pictures would just kind of flash in your mind. I mean, I know you, you can see this with yourself even if you've watched a movie the night before. You'll sort of ruminate on things in the movie for quite some time. So um, every time that would happen to me, I would, I'm, I'm, conf I'm confessing, and I'm expect, I'm, I would say things like, okay, Lord, you saw what just happened to me. Uh, you, you saw what I just did and what I just thought, and I ask you to forgive me, and I ask you to cleanse me from this, okay? And then gradually it became less and less, until at the end of three years, I never had it happen again. Okay, so that's a kind of small example of what I know is true. I know it's true. It's not that I, you know, sometimes I think that we use the word believe too much. <laughs> Instead, I think... I think Carl Jung was once asked at the end of his life, he had said that, uh, somebody said, well, do you believe in God? And he stopped for a long time before he answered. This is like a recorded uh, interview with him. And he said, no, I know God. He said, I actually, to tell you the truth, I never saw someone seriously mentally ill get better without God. So, you know, there's just, all of us could give you anecdote after anecdote of how, what biblical principles say are actually true in our lives. Now, do all Christians, do we do that? Do I act Christian all the time? No, I don't. Because I do have sin. There is such a thing as sin. There is a way to cleanse yourself, to get cleansed from it. 
and not cleanse yourself, but there is a way to get cleansed from it, and uh, there is a way to gradually improve. And that's what C.S. Lewis was saying, which I started to say a minute ago. And what he said was that uh, any person, like there, there are people who are not Christians who act better than Christians do. And he said the only thing that is really guaranteed in the Christian principles is that a person who becomes a Christian will become a better person than that person would have been if they didn't become a Christian. That's really all you can say. Okay. Hi. Hello. Do you believe that a seriously mental ill person cannot get better without God? Well, no, I know I've never dealt with seriously mentally ill people. I'm just telling you what Jung said was his experience. Oh, I thought you said you had never seen. I, I have never seen, I've never worked with seriously mentally ill people. I'm just telling you what Carl Jung said to this interviewer. But okay. I do believe, but I would say that I do believe that with God, th much more is possible okay. than without Thank you. him. Yeah. Hello again. Okay, um, hi. <laughs> I, I, I'm again interested in uh, your opinions on the power of prayer. Um, you know, we sometimes see people, you know, they lose their car keys or something, and they pray, please, God, help me find my car keys. You know, and they find them, and they're like, yes, God, you did that for me. I appreciate it. And then there's people who, you know, pray for uh, the, the wellness of, like, children in Africa that are starving, hundreds, hundreds, hundreds upon hundreds every night. And, you know, um, one explanation of that, you know, everything's part of God's plan. You know, they, they receive a reward in heaven or, or some explanation. But I want to know is how much, um, you know, if I invest some time and I pray, pray for people, how much does that actually come into fruition as God says, okay, enough, enough people have prayed for this cause, I think I'm going to act on it. <laughs> so I'm just curious, how, how, what, what is your explanation on the power, power of prayer and how much time should be invested in praying or how much time should be more invested in acting upon, trying to find a cause? Or I just want to know about that, that aspect of what your beliefs are. Well, you would both act and pray. I mean, I, I think that Mother Teresa is probably the best example I can give here. They prayed so they would have the strength and the wisdom uh, to be able to do what they did. And if you ever, if you ever see them or ever went there, uh, it was amazing. I mean, you would sit there and say, how do these people do this day in and day out? And the way they do it is through they believe, and the I believe too, that um, that that is through prayer and not every prayer is answered we don't know why we won't know that on we won't know that on this side of heaven but uh, but we so and there and there is sin in the world I mean a lot of people raise the issue of evil there is sin in the world because we have free will there we go. so <laughs> just to make one Last point. Just, uh, rewording the questions a tiny tiny bit Okay. Is, there an ever, is there ever a hypothetical situation that if I don't pray for something, you know, being, you know, logic-minded and I, I like to do tests and things, I say, I, I grew up and I, I prayed a lot, you know. Uh -huh. I prayed for a lot of things. I prayed for myself. I prayed for other people. I prayed for, I spent a lot of time praying. Uh -huh. um, at a certain point, say around junior in high school, I say, I wonder, I, I really am interested how much this is helping. You know, um, so I did, a, I did a test. I said, okay, I'm not going to pray for anything, no matter how tempting. You know, no matter how, I wanna, how much I want to find my car keys or how much I want to find my lost wallet, I'm not going to pray for it. I'm not going to ask for God's help because I want to see how much is possible if I leave God out of the picture. Mm -hmm. And a very curious thing happened. Um, I ended up becoming a much more confident person in determining my own fate. Since I no longer am always needing, it's what happened was since I wasn't, wasn't using God as a crutch and saying I need him to do everything for me, I said I'll do it for myself, you know. And it's, it was a weird feeling because I'm wondering why my life felt like it was getting better the farther and farther away I detached myself with, with, with God. And I wonder what your opinion on that was and um, just, just your reaction. Well, I don't, it's hard to say whether your life got better. I doubt, I doubt it. I think you might have felt freer. And uh, you might have had more um, 
self-confidence in a, in a certain way, which in Judeo-Christianity is usually called pride. And um, I think that the, I think it, it would be hard from that experiment to know whether or not God existed and, and actually answered your prayer, um, your prayers or heard you. I mean, there are times when I've prayed for things that I shouldn't have, that in retrospect, I, I didn't get and I shouldn't have gotten it. I could see what, what would have happened had I gotten it. And, um, and so I, I be definitely believe in the power of prayer. Um, I believe people have changed cities through the power of prayer. I think that uh, people's lives are changed through the power of prayer. And part of the power of prayer is that you get changed. You know, that's kind of the, big, the biggest piece is as you pray, you get more wisdom and insight and uh, strength and, uh, um, I guess, righteousness. You, you, you get more. I think when we don't stand, the, the biggest problem, I think, for uh, when I was um, a secular humanist and um, all those other things is that uh, I had a good deal of pride about control, being able to control my life. And yes, you can do that to some degree. I do believe that you are then open to um, spirits that you may not be aware of. And, spirit, and you may have opened, your, opened yourself to spiritual transactions that you wouldn't like if you really could see them from God's point of view. That's all. Isn't that also a very Western approach to prayer? prayer? Mm -hmm. uh -oh. So you're expressing the million Yeah, I, I, just a comment about prayer specifically yeah. from my experiences and just um, prayer is as much as it is trying to like pray to God to change things as much as it is God like allowing you to bend yourself to his will rather than you him bending himself to what you want mm -hmm. and also if you consider it the cost of what it is for us to be able to pray to God was so high in Christ dying on the cross mm -hmm. God obviously cared quite a bit um, in order to allow us to have an infinite relationship with him. And so that's why we pray to him, because the cost was so high, God cared that much that we would have that opportunity and that ability to talk to him. That's a great answer. Great. Thank you. So I'm not sure if I should address prayer or talk about worldviews, which is more interesting. Because <laughs> prayer, Okay. Um, the plural of anecdote is not data, and we do have data about prayer, and it didn't confirm that prayer has any effect. This was a study done on praying for uh, victims, people with terminal cancer, and seeing who survived. And the you know, some people survived the so-called diagnosed terminal, but the rates of survival weren't different for the group that was prayed for versus the control group. I don't think they actually prayed against anyone. I don't think they prayed for people to die, but... <laughs> I wouldn't think so. Um, I know that there are studies, I haven't looked at them in about, um, I'd say, seven years, but um, there are a lot of studies, and they're pretty conflicting. I mean, for every study that says prayer doesn't work, you can find another study that says it does. I guess I would um, refer you to... Um, trying to, I can't think of the author right now but, now, but if you email me, I can get it for you. Who does books, I don't even know if the man is Christian, but he does a lot of books on the relationship between religion and physical health, and religion, um, well, not him, but other people do religion and mental health. And there's very high correlations uh, between religious people. It's just like the, you might not have been there last night, but I read a, a piece of a study. Um, where they found that, okay, they were looking at old elderly people, and they were looking at the issue of forgiveness, which has become an issue even for secular psychology. And they studied this, I don't know, 2,000 older people, and they found that older people who told them that they had been forgiven by God were two and a half times more likely to forgive un other people unconditionally. Okay. Now, even though this was a study in a psychology journal, and that's what they found, and they reported that from the statistics, in their summary of the article, they went secular. So they ended up interpreting that as that these people had been in churches which had a particular psychosocial 
climate sure. or environment, right? So, but the issue from their data was that people who said, I've been forgiven for a lot of things by God, and I th therefore ha need to forgive these other people. But it's just interesting to me that the study I cited, if it had confirmed this, that would be absolutely phenomenal. That would be uh, evidence not just that prayer is good for your psychology, but that it actually works and that there actually must be something supernatural responding to it. Whereas the one that you suggested, if it mentioned it, confirms that there's a psychological effect, but it doesn't really tell us much about what caused that. No, the one I mentioned, they, I, anal, they in the end, the the authors deal with it as a psychological effect, sure. just like in the Leslie Newbegin piece but that a, I read As you. opposed to the one I mentioned, could not have really been dealt with as a psychological effect if it had been confirmed. Um, it's also, there's one with, and I promise I will get out of the way. Um, uh, because the effect that it has on people is a different issue from whether or not it's true. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, same thing with the well, magnitude of the sacrifice. I mean, we have um, we have a the story from Greek mythology of Prometheus, mm -hmm. who to this day, if the story is true, is getting his liver pecked out so that you can have fire, and that seems like a lot greater of a sacrifice to me than three nights in hell and then being the king of the universe. But that's. I think. Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm done. Let me just say that in the example that you just gave, you're talking about a mythological character. Yes. Everybody knows that was a mythological character. It was a mythological god. The but Greeks, that, the Greeks the did not is, believe these were people or r real. The Greeks didn't. Yeah, and they so did. they, okay. so that's a very different story. I mean, it's not Jesus coming as God. Uh, the word. <laughs> being made flesh on earth, the word of God that created the universe being made flesh on earth, and then choosing to actually die for the sins of all people. That's a very different thing. There's a historical, there are many historical documents that say Jesus lived, they did die, they did rise again. I don't think you could find that for Prometheus, or I don't think you're going to find it. The point is that which one is true is what's important. Yes, it is actually. Which one is true? Right. We have two more questions. All right. Um, the um, pr the two prayer questions brought up okay. a, um, an interesting point. I think. Uh, do you believe that um, uh, Christianity or any um, uh, along any faith along those lines could be um, in whole or in any part verified using a scientific method or you know a, as you call it, secular means of investigation? Yes. I mean, Francis Bacon developed the scientific method, and he believed that the more we knew through his method, the more we would know about the mind of God. I believe that if you don't believe in miracles, there is a way to know that a person has cancer on Friday, goes to church, gets prayed over, and on Monday doesn't have it. But I don't see secular people looking at that. Well, okay, but you just brought up two anecdotes, and I was referring to scientific method. Like tests and data and stuff like that. That's what I'm saying. You could use the scientific method to determine that. Right, but you brought up two anecdotes, and which aren't scientific. I was just wondering. And um, well, I've heard I've heard people will say if some person do a says scientific study. You got to have a lot of anecdotes. No, no. I mean that's not how scientific be... method works. Well, there is qualitative research, but I think he wants me to talk about quantitative research. Let's say. That you're gonna, you want to know whether or not miracles actually happen when people are sure, prayed that, for yeah, to get be, better, yeah. right? Okay, so you're gonna get a group of people who have been prayed for, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's what that study that he. Re, that yeah, he I'm not familiar with, with those studies. But. Okay, and you apply the scientific method to it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm just giving you an example of what one of those people that you would be looking at would might have experienced. So, okay, I had cancer, but now I don't, right? You would have a bunch of those people in a scientific study because you'd be wanting to apply the, uh, the formula for determining uh, right. probability, I think, right? I mean, I might be wrong, but I think in his case, he was referring that the frequency of um, cases that improved were about mm -hmm. even on both sides. And yeah, so, I, I mean, from a scientific that. perspective, that would say that um, 
there's no um, correlation between prayer and the effect. I mean, I've heard explanations for it. I was just wondering if there were impos like possible tests that could be done that would... Sure. You could re replicate that study. And right. you could Do look you, at the other studies who actually, okay. that actually came out in the other All Right. Way. And then I was wondering um, if you think if there are tests that could confirm it, do you think that there could be um, scientific tests that could um, disprove or discount uh, sure. Christianity? There could be. Okay, thank you. That's my question. Well, I just, it's not really a question, but a comment. And the, the comment is, is that uh, God is a person, not a thing. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a problem with the sort of, uh, sort of scientific um, proofs of God in the sense that you're, you know, what you're really, evidence for God as a person is quite different than evidence for whether that podium exists or not, right? Right. Or so, or you know, it's really, and, and what Christians believe is that, um, you know, we're called into a relationship mm -hmm. with God through Christ, right? right. And so, um, in my mind anyway, the, the strongest evidence that God exists is that uh, I can have a relationship with him right. and I can, uh, can yeah. learn to come to know him over time. Right. And it's just like uh, Anne's a friend of mine and I know her. If all I knew about her was this object standing over here, I couldn't really prove that she existed. But I know her as a person, right? So knowing God as a person is different than trying to prove God exists as a thing, right. I think. So. Right, right, exactly. I think, you can, I think that, that there are studies that where you could do studies and prove the things that you're asking about. But I, I think what you're saying and what's really important, Tom, is that, um, that there's so much more to Christianity than a proof about a single prayers or a group of prayers or something. And that comes from those people who, anybody in the room who knows Christ and has had an experience with them can tell you many, uh, many reasons why they know God exists. We'd like to thank Dr. Poplin. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for being here and for your participation. Please remember to leave your response cards in the boxes as you leave. And we hope to see you back at some of the panels and the follow-up discussions that will follow up 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 discussions that will up discussions that will up discussions that will up discussions that will up discussions that will